Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have the pleasure of having today uh, Professor Hans Klevers uh, to deliver the Distinguished Carreras Lecture. He studied biology and medicine at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, so he's an EMD PhD. And from there, he did a postdoc at the Dana Farber in the, in the US. He went back to Europe uh, as professor in the immunology in the University Medical Center in Utrecht. He, he became also a principal investigator at the Hubrecht Institute, also in the Netherlands, and investigator at the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology. He has also uh, he was also appointed as director of the Hubrecht Institute and the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology for, for several years. And uh, his, his work has been uh, widely recognized by, by many awards that I will have time to go through. But just to mention the, the Association for uh, Portland Research on Cancer in France, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Science from the, from the US, the Korber European Science Prize in Germany, the Princess Takamatsu Award in Japan. So you can see very international recognition. And just to congratulate him, because this week he has been recognized with an international award by the Pescolar Foundation and the ACR. Uh, he's not here for his award, he's here for his research, and his research has been a pioneer in many fields, but just to mention two. One is the deciphering of the, um, of the pathways, the wind pathways, and the interaction with the elements like TCF and, and beta-catenin, and the identification in that, in, in that uh, area of research of a generic marker LGR5 of adult stem cells. And this uh, brought him to uh, an another field, probably, that is the, the expansion and the, the eclosion of the organoids uh, in cancer, but beyond cancer. And these organoids are these mid-organ tissues that now are widely used because they, are, they reproduce in a very loyal manner many of the pathology, even diseases, and they are easy to study that, or uh, easy to, um, to work with that some primary samples are more real than some of the 2D cells. So he's here to give his lecture. Uh, remember that there are, this is a chat. You can ask your question using the chat, and I will uh, collect all these questions at the end I'll, and, and present it to, to the speaker. So the title of his talk is Organoids to Model Human Disease by Professor Hans Klevers. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Manel. I hope uh, you can hear me and that you can see my, my slides. So what I'll try to do in the next 45, 50 minutes is, is give you some background on the systems that we have originally studied that you see here, the gut, and how this led to the development of organoid technology. And then I'll give a number of uh, uh, older, but also some very recent examples of how we have been using that technology. What you see here is the inside of the gut. Uh, these protrusions are called villi, and uh, at the base of these villi, you see these little pits. They're called crypts, the crypts of Lieberkuhn. Um, and at the base of the crypts, it has long been suspected that there would be stem cells. And these multicolored cells, I'll try to convince you in the next few slides, actually are the stem cells uh, of this tissue. And here you see a different view of the same uh, subject. So this is the gut, uh, lumen. I hope you can see my cursor, but food would pass by from left to right. This is a villus. Uh, at the base of the villus, there may be up to 10 different crypts. And there's a very dynamic production of cells in the gut epithelium, small intestine, uh, where the stem cells are believed to sit at the base of the crypts. They produce uh, daughters every day. These daughters very rapidly proliferate. They take only two days while they're proliferating to, to basically exit the crypt. They then take up one of about 10 different cell fates. Um, most of them will continue to move up for another um, two to three days. And by day five, they're at the tips of the villi and they undergo apoptosis. So we were heavily interested in trying to find the, these enigmatic stem cells here that probably are the most active stem cells of the human and mouse body. And we had an, uh, an entry into this because we, we had found 20 years ago that wind signaling is key to maintain these crypt stem cells at least the crypt activity. And at the same time, together with Bert Vogelstein, we found that, uh, that aberrant wind signaling, mutationally activated in colon cancer, is the major driver of, uh, of, of, of adenomas and eventually uh, carcinomas. So by basically side by side working on normal crypts and working on colon cancers, where in both cases wind was crucial, we um, eventually resolved uh, actually, uh, Edu Bacce and uh, Elena Sanchez were very important in this as well in the lab then, they're in Barcelona. 
TRB, um, we actually solved the, uh, the target gene program that's driven by wind in colon cancer, about 200 genes. Uh, we then found that those genes are also present. They're expressed in normal crypts, also driven by wind. And amongst those genes, Nick Barker, after a couple of years, found a unique marker, LGR5. We now have a few more genes that behave the same way. And they, they lit up these tiny cells that sit in between the much larger planet cells. And these actually, as I'll show you, turned out to be uh, the stem cells. So here, essentially, this is an LGR5 GFP knock-in. So that's why you see these stem cells in green. So these are the cells that have the marker. They also have CRE-ER. This now allows us to do a lineage tracing experiment. If we eject tamoxifen, we can turn uh, a few of these cells uh, in a color, uh, for instance, blue, permanently. And then if we just wait, and this is done by Nick in these mice, uh, and over the next few days, you see that indeed this, this blue candidate stem cell pr uh, produces blue daughter cells. That's how we know that they come from that stem cell. And then within two days, they leave the crypt, as you can see here. They then differentiate into uh, one of about 10 different cell types, as already said. You see two here, coupled cells, enterocytes. And then over the next few days, these blue cells will move up further uh, up the flanks of the villi. So now they're exposed to the lumen of the gut. They help digest food and, and pump nutrients and liquids into the lymph and blood vessels. Um, and then when they're five or six days old, indeed, the first blue cells reach the tips of the villi and they undergo apoptosis as we had, uh, had predicted. Now these ribbons persist for the lifetime of the mouse, meaning that the cell that we turned blue at day zero of the experiment is long lived. It, does, it doesn't live five days like all other cells, it lives forever, three years in a mouse. And in a ribbon produced by one of these cells, we could see all of the cell types. And therefore we, uh, we claimed that these LJ5 stem cells uh, or these LJ5 positive cells are the stem cells in the crypts. Um, a different way of doing this experiment uh, was done by Hugo Snippert and Lawrence van der Vlier. So they created the confetti reporter allele. So now we just don't turn the cells, the stem cells blue, but we give them one of four colors randomly. Uh, when you make the confetti allele homozygous, you actually have 10 false colors, but I'll show you here the four color situation. So when you do this, eventually a crypt will pick one of the colors because there's one stem cell that wins this neutral competition, but every crypt can pick its own color. And, and Jeroen Huyve, who makes these movies, uh, predicted that this is what we would see in the gut. And indeed, uh, this is a confocal image. Uh, done by Hugo Snippert. The muscle layer is here, the lumen is here. You can see multiple villi uh, that are now stained uh, with the confetti colors. And on the blow up, you can see that every crypt resolves into an individual color, produces cells that in parallel bands move up to the flanks of the villi. So this is one large villus surrounded by multiple crypts. And you can see that the cells actually hardly mix when they move up uh, side by side to the tips of the villi. When we're doing these experiments, we not only notice that these patterns in the gut, but we notice them in many other tissues, particularly after damage. So uh, hair follicles, stomach, uh, liver, pancreas. Uh, and we now believe that LGR5 is a marker for any epithelial stem cell in any tissue, ectodermal, mesodermal, endodermal, but only in the active state of that stem cell. But the stem cell is quiescent typically. It doesn't, it doesn't express LGR5, but the moment it receives wind signals to become activated, it upregulates LGR5 and then will, uh, will, will be visible in our, in our mice. And so these mice that Nick had made have been used by us, but also by many other labs to study stem cells in a variety of tissues. So one very curious thing that we noted was the fact that these stem cells were dividing every day. In a mouse, it takes about 23 hours for them to, uh, to divide. In humans, it's a bit longer. But it was strongly believed um, 10, 15 years ago that adult stem cells should not proliferate. They should proliferate very, very occasionally because uh, when they divide, they will have to copy their DNA, their genome. They can make a few mistakes and this could then lead to cancer or to harm to the stem cell, which could then be lost. So it was believed that stem cells, all stem cells use the strategy to very rarely divide and only the daughter cells are allowed to, pro to proliferate a lot. Now, that's a great idea, but it turns out to be not true for the gut and, and for several other uh, tissues like stomach epithelium or hair follicles. So there the stem cells essentially are almost continuously active. And, and based on this observation, Toshi Sato, a few, late, few years after, after Nick uh, 
uh, try to see if you could grow these stem cells. And we, uh, we knew quite a bit about the growth factor requirements of crypts. So crypts need wind, and we used the our spondin molecule, a wind amplifier. We, we later found that actually our spondin is the ligand of LGR5. I don't show that here, but these come together. Um, epithelial growth factor, key to keep, keep uh, CRIPS active. And a BMP inhibitor is also we, from an old experiment that we did uh, 15 years ago. We knew that we needed to block BMP. So three recombinant growth factors, nothing else, no serum. We do this in Matri gel. There's still no really good synthetic gel, but I'm sure they will be developed. Matri gel is, uh, is made by human cancers grown in, uh, in mice collagen, laminin mostly. Uh, the idea was we'll take one of these stem cells, we'll turn it into many stem cells, but something very different happened. We got these epithelial structures, you see them growing here. And um, essentially what we were looking at that we realized after a while, and Toshi called these things mini guts, were mini versions of the normal epithelium. So a single stem cell creates something that's that's pretty complete. So the, the, the buds are the crypts, you see them here. Stem, many stem cells would sit at the tips of, the, of these buds. Panhead cells there, rapidly dividing daughters. And the central lumen that you see forming here is lined by all of the other uh, cell types that you would see in a normal gut. So to remarkably complete, they, they grow forever. Telomeres don't shorten. Um, we never saw oncogenic mutations occurring. We still have not seen oncogenic mutations in any of our organoid systems in culture. That would be a worry if you really grow these cells for, for many years. Um, the ultimate test to see if they really have, have remained normal, despite the fact that they proliferate so much, was by uh, taking a single stem cell. This was done by Toshi in Utrecht, in the lab here, from an RFP-positive mouse, from a, a red fluorescent protein-positive mouse. It also has the green fluorescent protein from the LGR5 locus, so they're green and red. That single cell was grown as organoids into about 100 million cells, then sent to Tokyo to our collaborators uh, in the lab of Mamoru Watanabe. And they infused these Dutch red organoids, you see one here, through the anuses of about 40 mice that had been treated with uh, DSS, a chemical that induces inflammatory bowel disease. So here you look inside a colon, normal epithelium here, but this is a lesion uh, that you typically see in, in inflammatory bowel disease, an IBD, and these organoids will not attach to normal epithelium, but the moment they see exposed collagens, et cetera, with their integrins that are on the outside, the basal side of these epithelia is on the outside, they will actually adhere to these uh, lesions, and then they will open up, and like a living band-aid, they seal these lesions. The real experiment is here, a colon of a no, black colon of a Japanese mouse. This is a patch of uh, the offspring of that single red uh, Dutch uh, colon stem cell. And the only way to really find it is look for the fluorescence with the confocal microscope, as you can see here. And it, 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 it turns out that this tissue is fully integrated by any marker that we can use. It looks like normal tissue. And um, uh, we did not see any of the two predictions. One was a prediction that, well, these cells really have become malignant. You've grown them for years uh, in the lab. Uh, they'll probably make adenomas or they'll make carcinomas. We have never seen that happening, or I should say mamoras, people never saw that. Uh, the other prediction would be these stem cells have divided so much, they are now exhausted. So they maybe sit there for a brief while, but then this patch will disappear. That's also not what we see. So they're happily sitting in the mice and they live as long as we let the we let the mouse live. So um, this shows, I think, uh, convincingly that indeed you can take a single stem cell, expand it dramatically, and the cells that you make are still normal primary cells. They have, they have not turned into cell lines with oncogenic mutations. So since then, we and, and then later many other labs uh, joined in, have come up with, with protocols to grow organoids from, from human tissues. Uh, so in principle, it's simple. You take a, a little bit of the tissue, you know, a, a cubic millimeter, grind it up into even smaller pieces, uh, 50 cells, 20 cells in each of these fragments. Uh, you stick it in matri gel, you add the, uh, the optimal growth factor cocktail, which is, which is always similar to what I just showed you. So there's always wind, there is always a tyrosine kinase receptor ligand that can be EGF or IGF or FGF. And there's always a BMP TG beta inhibitor. But on top of that, for instance, memory gland likes the, uh, the female steroid hormones, prostate likes testosterone, the liver likes uh, hepatocyte growth factor. So you, so you have to modify. And for some of these protocols, we need eight or nine 
growth factors or inhibitors, but it typically takes a half year or a year for anybody in the lab to pick up a new epithelial tissue and come up with a protocol that allows us to grow this. Now, because we can do this directly from patient material, we can, uh, we can take cancers. I'll give you examples. So we can take samples from a tumor side by side with the normal tissue from that same individual. Uh, we can take samples from hereditary diseases. I don't show it today, but cystic fibrosis, for instance, we can be build beautiful functional models. And, uh, and at the end of the talk, I'll show you two examples of how we've used this, this to model human infectious diseases, where I mean, there's quite a few uh, pathogens that cannot be grown on cell lines, cannot be grown on animals, but, but can be uh, studied now in, in human organoids. So first, cancer. Um, what we've been doing here, other labs have done this as well, is use this technology not to grow normal tissue, but to grow normal tissue plus cancer tissue side by side. So here in Dutch, you see gezond means healthy, ziek means sick. So we take samples from the healthy and from the tumor tissue. We grow them in the lab. And as you can see below in the slide, we can do this for essentially all carcinomas. Um, we can sequence but that could have been done directly on the tumor. The sequences you get are pretty pure because nothing else grows out. So we lose the fibroblast, the immune cells, the blood vessels, everything that we're growing is a cancer cell. So the sequences are beautiful, but we lack other components of the tumor. But we can also, um, we can expose them now to drugs. And, and one application of this technology would be to use this for personalized medicine, much like you would use uh, bacterial cultures for antibiotic screening, where you can find uh, the best antibiotic for an individual patient. That's done routinely in the past since, since 50, 60 years. But we would propose that with uh, cancer organoids, you can do the same thing, grow them in the lab, expose them to a, a number of, of drug combinations that you know can be given to, for instance, a colon cancer patient, and then score in the lab which combination is actually best in killing the individual uh, patient's uh, cancer cells. Um, this is what they look like, healthy tissue, tumor tissue from one uh, patient. We have large biobanks in Utrecht now, as you can see here, of breast cancer and lung cancer and liver cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do drug screens quite easily. Uh, it's still quite tedious. It takes multiple weeks to have enough organoids. There are now companies that are, that are designing robots that uh, use microfluidics and can all do this at a micro scale, so much faster and much cheaper than what is currently being published by, by us and by many other labs. Uh, but the assays in this format are at least extremely robust. So if you, if you freeze the cells, you saw, thaw, you thaw them out, you still get the same outcome. We were trying to validate this approach by running side by side organoids parallel to a clinical trial. So we would get actually tissue from the patient and we get information back, you know, how the patient responded in a trial to a drug. And at the same time in the lab, we would have already tested that same drug uh, with the organoids of that patient. And then we could compare how well the organoids would predict what's happening in real life in the clinic. Uh, while we were doing this, uh, we were scooped by this beautiful paper uh, from the UK in science uh, three years ago. Um, and these people show uh, in a number of small phase one, two trials, mostly uh, intestinal cancers, that the predictive value of organoids would be in the order of 80 to 95%. And this is exceedingly high, much, much higher than you get from standard diagnostics, because overall it's estimated that whenever you are a cancer patient and you're put on the protocol treatment, you'll have a 40% chance that you will respond to that protocol, that you'll benefit from that protocol. Uh, and 60% that you don't respond. Of course, every patient gets all the side effects. So with this approach, this paper states, well, if you use organoids, you are, you're much better in predicting what would be good for an individual patient. So then uh, a number of additional papers came out in 2019, and this actually, my lab played small roles, but it was always involved in these. Similar numbers, 80 to 90%, predictive value of organoids now and now actually there are many more papers that are coming out where, where people around the world are, are trying to develop this into something that's useful in the clinic. So that's one approach to, to cancer. You can actually grow the cancers. Another one is you can actually create cancers, much like what has been done for many years now in mice, where you engineer uh, changes in cancer genes and then induce tumors in mice, but you can do the exact same thing and much faster, much more efficient in human organoids. And uh, the, first, uh, the first studies were probably five years old, done in my lab by Jarno Drost and totally independently by Toshi, 
um, we didn't know that we actually had the same projects going but the papers were sort of published at the same time and we both realized that if you look at the most common mutations in colon cancer that they they fully reflect what we use as growth factors to grow normal colon epithelium so we need wind and our spondin to grow colon organoids apc if you knock it out it's actually a negative regulated wind pathway if you knock it out you would no longer need wind in the medium that was one prediction second egf key to grow organoids but if you activate KRAS, the prediction would be what cancers do, that cell would no longer need EGF. SMAT4 is a transcription factor in the BMP pathway. Normal organoids need NOGIN, a BMP inhibitor. If you knock out SMAT4, you block BMP signaling. And uh, so if you would do that, uh, either with CRISPR or a cancer can do that, you would no longer need the BMP inhibitors. So it's really remarkable that what we empirically found to be the key growth factors for normal um, gut cells, normal gut stem cells, cancers target the exact same pathways by mutations, by taking the negative regulators out here or activating the pathway with KRAS. And of course, we also engineered in P53, which is uh, mutant in almost all solid cancers. And in thus, we wanted to re recapitulate what's called the Vogelgram in the field. Uh, Bert Vogelstein in the early 90s uh, proposed that normal cells in the colon will eventually in a stepwise in a fairly ordered fashion progress through these intermediate stages of adenomas to a full-blown carcinoma that is invasive and can also metastasize and uh, the first gene uh, that people assume to be mutated is apc and these others then appear more or less in a in a ordered fashion so the way we do this and i'll summarize this in a movie very quickly so again we want to recreate this this adenoma to carcinoma sequence that was proposed by bert vogelstein by an ordered uh, crispr uh, driven uh, in induction of cancer genes and uh, what we do is we start from a normal healthy colon epithelium growing in three growth factors um, we target apc that's the first one Prediction is we would no longer need wind in the medium. So every, everybody that's targeted will grow out without wind, the rest will die. That's what you see happening here. So this one has an APC mutation. Uh, we now target the second gene, P53. Um, there we can select by adding a small molecule called Nutlin. It will kill, as you see here, all of the cells. Only the P53 mutants will survive. So now we have organoids that have two mutations on two alleles each. KRAS, oncogene, we need to activate it by knock-in. Now we no longer need EGF, so the normal organoids will die, but the ones with the KRAS activating mutation will now survive, and they only need NOGIN at this point. And to take that dependence away, we target SMAT4, transcription factor on the BMP pathway, and we leave NOGIN out of the medium, so there's now no growth factors at all in this culture anymore, and now they have all four mutations. And then the idea would be that we can now transplant these organoids, we do this orthotopically in the colon, and we can score you know, what the phenotype is of the tumors that grow out. And essentially, very rapidly, we see that only the organoids that have all four mutations, so APC, they're no longer dependent on wind, KRAS, they're no longer dependent on EGF, P53, they're now genomically unstable, and SMAT4, they're no longer dependent on BMP inhibitors or MOGA. And only those will form, will form invasive tumors that actually metastasize to the liver. And these other combinations make things that are much more benign or don't even grow much at all, as you can see here. Um, so that is a way, another way of applying organoid technology. And actually you can engineer any combination of, of oncogenic uh, or tumor suppressor uh, mutations and then and make your, your, your method of choice. And there's quite a few models recently been published for other like cholangiocarcinomas or lung cancers where this is applicable. So this is a story that we published uh, quite recently. It's complex, so I'll try to take you through this. So I hope I don't lose you. Um, the, the project is actually uh, thought up by, um, by three PhD students without me knowing. Cayetano and uh, Jens are in my lab. Axel is in Ruben van Boxel's lab in a nearby Princess Maxima Center. And they had read about a, an E. coli. Now we all know E. coli as a household bacterium, you know, in, in molecular biology, but also a major microbiome bacterium in your colon. Everybody of you has E. coli in the colon, but there are many, many different strains of E. coli. And there's one particular strain that carries an extra piece of the DNA called PKS, and they've always been assumed to, the, to be dangerous. They are called genotoxic PKS E. coli. 
And here you see this summarized. Uh, so uh, actually this, this bad E. coli is often seen or more frequently seen in people that have colon cancer or that have inflammatory bowel disease. But as you can see, there's lots of things that, that, that these E. coli are accused of. They'll induce all of these, you uh, know, IL-6 and CCAM-6 goes up. Most importantly, that extra piece of DNA allows these bad versions of E. coli, but not the normal ones, to produce a substance that's called colibactin. This is the PKS islet, 60 kilobases. So it's just, it sits in the chromosome of the bad E. coli, about 10 genes. And these genes together are predicted to be a synthetic pathway uh, to produce a polyketide that's called colibactin. And I'll show you the structure a little bit later. So the idea would be that if E. coli has this extra piece of DNA, it can make this colibactin. And um, um, well, here you see, you see a little summary. Uh, and that colibactin is presumed to be a dangerous molecule. Normal E. coli don't make it, but the bad ones make it. And uh, what I should also stress is that probably about 10% of all people carry not a normal E. coli, but carry this, this possibly harmful version of E. coli. And you can see here it makes colibactin. Now, what's known? Um, as I already said, this bacterium is associated with cause and effect are not known with the, with species with polyps or with cancer or with inflammatory bowel syndrome. In about 10 to 30% of, of, of these diseases, uh, you'll, see, you'll see that. If you culture these particular E. coli on top of a standard cell line, you'll see DNA breaks. And I'll give you an example a little bit later. That's why they're called genotoxic. So it was believed that colibactin enters the host cell, causes DNA breaks. Uh, but at the same time, PKS E. coli is, is sold as a very popular probiotic. And this doesn't seem to be a very smart combination. And, and I think if you if I'll take you through the story, you'll see why that is not a good plan to give. And actually doctors, even in university hospitals, give these PKS positive E. coli to patients with inflammatory bowel disease and other diseases. Um, and and, and there even when we're, while we started these studies, we noted that there were 12 ongoing trials for a variety of different diseases at uh, trials.gov, the formal registration at NIH, for, um, for the use of these E. coli as a probiotic. So we asked, is PKS E. coli actually carcinogenic? So it causes double strand breaks, but it actually results in mutations and you, when you expose human colon cells to, uh, to these bacteria. So this is the experiment. We have uh, uh, the PKS, uh, the, the, the bad one. We also have a mutant, so the bad one's on the left, but then we have a mutant version that lacks one of the 10 genes. And that's on the right, that's our negative control. And what we want to do is compare these two um, when we expose uh, normal colon organoids to, to these bacteria. So on the left, we grow the, the bacteria on the petri dish, very easy. We pick them up in a little needle. Of course, these were my PhD students, not me. They inject the E. coli into a colon organoid, a normal colon organoid, you see that here. Um, let it sit there for about a week. And um, during that time, these, the, 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 the ones on the left can produce colibactin. The ones on the right feel they don't have one enzyme, so they cannot do this. Um, the first experiment we did was actually see, can we see that they are genotoxic? Uh, so here we just, this was a short-term experiment. We eject the bacteria. These are the bad ones. This is the negative control, the mutant of the bad ones. And when we stain for gamma H2AX foci, you essentially visualize breaks, double strand breaks in chromosomes. You can see there are large numbers of double strand breaks in the exposed organoids when we inject the bacteria inside. But there's no, there was actually a single break in this entire culture that you can see here. So indeed, we can recapitulate these bacteria cause double strand breaks. Now the question is, do, does this now, what, what happens with these breaks? Will these cells die? Can they repair them uh, correctly or will they introduce recognizable uh, problems? Now, while we were doing this, the structure of colibactin was published. Actually, there was another structure in science as well that was quite different from this one by another group. And there was an earlier structure, but we believe this is the, this is the real structure. And this paper predicts, it's a chemical paper, that colibactin has two warheads. And with these warheads, it covalently binds to adenosine residues in DNA. And they already predicted this would happen. Uh, one problem could be that actually here you have the two strands. Here's an A on one strand, here's an A on the other strand. That colibactin will now create a cross-link between the two strands, an interstrand cross-link. 
this is not tolerated by the cell because it can no longer divide its uh, divide and separate the chromatin strand the chromatin uh, the chromosome strands here so and this has to be resolved by the cell so this probably then leads to a double strand break and then the cell will desperately try to repair that break and we thought well maybe that is the moment that mutations will will be induced and and what we wanted to to, to determine is can we actually recognize the specific type of mutations that's produced by colibactin now now it gets more difficult this is a system that is set up by mike stratton um, about um, seven or eight years ago it's been extremely useful in in cancer research so what he set out um, is is uh, classifying mutations by first of all looking now by single base uh, mutations so what is the actual change so for instance c2g or c2t or c2a um, there are actually if you think about it only six uh, possibilities because the other six are on the other strand so you could classify them simply by looking at these but the more a finer kind of a classification would be not only to look at the base the original base and into what it is changed but also take the directly flanking bases into account so so you could be a c to g where there's an a upstream and an a downstream but you could also be a c to g where there's an a upstream and a g downstream and if you classify this system now there are 96 different triplets that you can score and um, if you do this for uh, for various cancers so so now the question is do in do particular carcinogens that that give you very particular cancers like lung cancers caused by tobacco smoke uh, do they give recognizable single base changes and that turns out to be the case because here you have the, the 96 different triplets where the middle base is, is essentially the base that changes so this is C, these are all the c2a's with the different flanking bases and you can see that cigarette smoke these are lung cancer patients cause C2A changes with some preference for the flanking bases, but essentially you can see it with any flanking base and nothing much happens elsewhere. So this is when you see this, when you sequence the cancer, you know this is a lung cancer from a smoker. In melanoma, this is caused by UV exposure to the skin. You don't see mutations here, but you get these very specific C2T mutations. And here you can see that probably about half of the C2T mutations, depending on the flanking bases, are scoring but these are the, the most common c2t so flanking t's and then ecg or t um, so you can see that that you are just sequencing dna you can say okay this is lung cancer from a smoker and this is melanoma from somebody exposed to uh, to uv light so we asked if we take colibactin from from our, our bacterium do we also see very specific uh, single base changes and defined by the direct um, flanking basis and to do that we didn't just inject one time but now uh, Jens and Cayetano uh, every week would inject would then treat with antibiotics to kill the bacteria uh, because otherwise they escape and they overgrow the culture and every week at the beginning they inject and at the end they they treat with antibiotics they passage and they've done this for three months and mimicking chronic exposure from the lumen of a mini gut to this bacterium and this is again the negative control the mutant eks e coli so then um, we want to know uh, are there any mutations that are induced by the bacteria we take single cells out of these three months ago organoids we grow single cells up again as small organoids to get enough dna to sequence uh, what has changed because we, we cannot just sequence the entire organ at that point because then the or the every cell will have unique mutations and we, you will not, we not, would not see them you really have to uh, add a clonal step when we now do this you can see that of course they mutate they accumulate some mutations that that are always happening they're mostly in this part of the spectrum but the ones exposed to the e coli all of a sudden we have very very specific uh, t's to c's here and there's not a pink one here that you do not see in the controls and um yeah and then this is actually so this is the this is what we get from the uh from the exposed organoids after three months this is what we get from the controls so they're very similar here but you can see when we subtract this one uh from this one the the difference is here you can see that these particular particularly these green ones this pink one um, never been seen before and uh, look and, and these we predict are caused by colibactin um because i don't have to show but we then wanted to be even more fancy we don't so so 
a TA pair, so a T on one strand and the A on the other, changes into any other base. A's and T's are always flanking. That's what we knew from that experiment. But we then started looking more extensively, and then we found actually at position minus three, there's almost always an A. Um, and, um, and this fits with, with the following model. So here you can see, the, see the, the mutational signature. So the TA pair here changes into any other base. Um, and at minus three, there is an A, if there is a T here. So this is very strongly suggestive that indeed colibactin binds to A, so it would bind with one warhead to the A here, that you see that here. With the other warhead, the red part here, it binds to the A at the opposite strand, so opposite this T. Um, now the cell wants to solve this. It probably cuts out this piece of DNA and then repairs it. And in that process, it can change this, this particular pair here into any other base, or it can actually um, uh, result in the loss. I don't show that here in the loss of this one base or sometimes two or three bases, but in the exact same motif. So we very strongly propose that colibactin is an oncogene, a carcinogenic oncogene that will bind covalently as predicted to these A's and, and, and actually then leave a very recognized mark in the DNA. So now we, uh, we can ask, um, now we know the, what the mutations look like that this bacterium induces in, the, in our very artificial laboratory organoid setup. Now we go to two very large human cancer cohorts. We could just look at the sequences and see, do we actually see the occurrence of this very specific signature of mutations? So this change of a, a TA pair into any other base with an AT pair at minus three. Um, we work together with a large cohort in Amsterdam, the Hartley Medical Foundation, uh, that has many metastases from different tumors. Also with Genomics England, where we were allowed to look at their colon cancers. Um, this is the Hartwig outcome. So they have all of these different tumors. If you now ask the genomic sequences of these cancers, where do we see the colibactin induced very specific mutational signature? It happens in a subset of the colon cancers, 10 to 20%, depending on where we put the threshold. Breast or all these other tissues, we see nothing. Of course, these are sterile cancers and colon cancers are exposed to the microbiome, so potentially to PKS E. coli. We have one here, one uh, head and neck. I think we have a few more. Now, E. coli can live in the, uh, in the oral cavity. And we see one here, but we've seen a few more urinary tract cancers, bladder cancers. And again, um, E. coli can live in the bladder. So this is very strongly suggestive that indeed, this is not just a lab artifact, but a substantial fraction of colon cancers is probably induced by the presence of an oncogenic E. coli bacterium. And um, this is a different way of looking at this. I don't have to show that. Um, so these are random mutations in the genome of these cancer cells, but do we actually see these mutations in cancer genes? So are they really causative or do they just you know, uh, induce background mutations? And we actually find many, many cases that um, this particular signature, so a change, you see that here of this base pair here, uh, when there is an, a TA pair at minus three. So this is predicted to be caused by PKS E. coli. Um, and here, when you now go through in the, in the Cancer UK, UK consortium, when you now look at this large, uh, a large cohort of colon cancers, you can see that many of the stop codons that are seen in APC uh, bear this, uh, this, this uh, fingerprint of an E. coli PKS mutation of a colibactin induced mutation. So uh, conclusions is um, uh, PKS E. coli in organoids induces mutations. So they have these, the, the treated ones have many, have much higher mutational rates than the ones that are treated with the control, the mutant bacterium. So they induce mutations. They're, the mutations are extremely recognizable. If you don't follow this, we can actually ask, you know, with bioinformatics, when we see a single base change, can this be caused by colibactin? And in colon cancer, we see those. So we see uh, that this signature is increased in 10 to 20% of colorectal cancer ca cases. We would now propose that actually these particular, these 10 to 20% are caused or are co-caused by this bacterium. Um, it also has implications. You can actually start looking for who carries the bacterium. And if indeed they are uh, 
causing cancer, you might actually remove them. And it would be a simple antibiotic treatment and then a fecal transplant of an individual that doesn't carry this particular strain of E. coli. You could uh, remove, much like uh, now many people are now being treated for helicobacter in their stomach, where eventually they'll get stomach cancer. So here you could possibly, if this all holds up in larger cohorts, could prevent uh, colon cancer. And also, I would say that we have really have to reevaluate the use of PKS E. coli as a probiotic. Probiotics are never tested in trials, uh, but our prediction would be if you do a real serious trial with these things, you'll see increased amounts of uh, increased numbers of colon cancer cases in patients treated with these probiotics. Uh, and then finally, I have another five minutes or so. Uh, we've also used organoids to model infectious diseases, and, and we think this is of particular interest for, for pathogens that cannot be cultured on standard cell lines. And I guess for corona, I'll give a brief example where actually you can see why this would be, would be important. But for instance, also norovirus cannot be cultured in a lab. Norovirus is, is, is a pretty big problem in, uh, on cruise ships, but also in homes of the elderly. And if you're sort of weak and old, you can be killed by, uh, by this intestinal infection of norovirus. Um, and another one that, and actually that was shown by Marie Estes, that you can, they could never be grown before, but they can grow, they can be grown in human organoids. Um, an example from my lab is Cryptosporidium. This is a protozoan, so a eukaryotic parasite related to malaria with a very single, similar life cycle. So it has an asexual life cycle starting from an oocyst. So this is what you actually ingest. This will all happen in your gut. So you get, and I'll show that in the movie. Then there is a sexual stage that you see here sperm equivalence and oocyte equivalence, and eventually you'll make a zygote. And the idea of the experiment was that we take, uh, you can buy oocysts, so they're produced in calves in Texas, in a farm in Texas, but there was no laboratory model to, to study this parasite that causes intestinal infections. They can be pretty bad, particularly in the, in the developing world. So the idea would be that we inject the oocysts bought from Texas into human colon or human small intestinal organoids. These organoids have all of the differentiated cell types and that turns out to be crucial. Same for norovirus, they don't grow on cell lines. They need differentiated cells. So here you see an oocyst. Inside there are four sporozoites, uh, always four. Uh, as soon as the oocyst has landed, uh, these sporozoites will come out and they will now search uh, a target cell. This turned out to be a differentiated enterocyte. And when it, as soon as it is infects this enterocyte, it immediately forms a type one merond. You see that inside the sporozoite divides into eight individuals, merozoites, type one merozoites. So this is an amplification step. These merozoites leave the merond, they swim around, they infect the secondary enterocyte. Again, will produce a, uh, a nice structure, a type two merond. You see that here. Uh, four nuclei are inside the type 2 merond. Again, these little guys come out. Now they enter the sexual stage. We're now about 60 hours in the infection, as you see at the bottom left. Um, so the one in the front will be the, the, the sort of the testis equivalent, makes microgamonts. The one in the back is the ovary equivalent, makes macro, one macrogamont. Here you see the uh, microgamont swimming. This one is winning, reaches the macrogamont and fertilizes it. And this then recreates an oocyst. So now the cycle is complete, takes about in organoids about 120 hours. The oocyst will be released, uh, will then leave the body with the feces ready to be taken up by any next individual, which can be you know, a farm animal or a human being and leading to, a, to an infection. Now this could never be done on cell lines, could never be done in a lab. You needed these, these cattle to do that. But um, as you can see here, it works very nicely. It'll just, it is a lot more boring than looking at the movie, I guess. But by EM, you, you can see all of the stages. And if we, after four or five days, um, grind up the organoids and feed the oocysts to mice, they get a real infection. So we really make, we complete the entire life cycle. And I guess that the, the cryptosporidium field is now uh, slowly taking up this technology to be able to actually study this and maybe develop drugs against this parasite. Uh, by using lab-based models. And then finally, uh, during the lockdown, uh, our institute closed down, but we were allowed to do corona experiments. 
this is the 15th of March. Uh, I actually wrote to uh, to the big uh, Corona lab in, 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 in Rotterdam, led by uh, Marion Koopmans, who was also part of the WHO delegation that went to Wuhan to see where the virus came from recently. Um, and we had realized in Utrecht that ACE2, the receptor for Corona, is extremely highly expressed on, on villi, much higher than anywhere else in the body. Um, second, we had started to read about the fact that uh, COVID-19 patients often present with GI symptoms. Sometimes it's the only symptoms they have, so it's not always a, a pneumonia. It's not always a respiratory infection. They are not. They get nausea. They get diarrhea. They get stomach aches. Um, and so that would suggest that there's a second route of following um, of, of for the virus to actually cause infections and infecting next patients through their feces. And some people had shown by PCR that there was viral RNA in the stool of, of COVID patients. Not clear whether it was live virus or whether it was just passive RNA that was come out of the lungs and then ingested and ended up in the stool. So we wanted to show or ask whether we could infect normal human intestinal epithelial cells. So in this study, this is quite remarkable. We actually did it in, 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 in from, from the start, from the first email to Rotterdam to the online publication in Science. It took six weeks. So we did the experiment three or four times. Um, at the same time, wrote the paper. Reviewers at Science actually did a very serious critical review. We wrote a rebuttal, modified the paper, resubmitted again. Everybody worked extremely fast. And this, I think this this shown, and many people who've done corona research know this, that science Corona science moves much, much faster and is extremely collaborative. So everybody immediately opens up the labs, provides anything you need. So, so when we when we do our best in the scientific field, actually you can have an idea and have it published in, in six weeks. So this is a key experiment. We infect uh, the intestinal organoids with either the SARS virus or the, the new one, the SARS-CoV-2. They, uh, within a matter of, of two and a half days, you have a, a, a 10,000 fold increase in viral particles, also in viral RNA. So they infect. Um, if we stain in white, it's, a, it's the nuclear protein of the virus. Green is the organoid. So you, if, you, if you manage to affect a single cell in an organoid, uh, very rapidly it'll spread through this organoid and affect almost all of the enterocytes. So it infects the enterocytes that are the cells that have high ACE2. We also did lots of RNA-seq and we, you know, we, 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 we uh, looked at interferon responses and things like that. But this is essentially the key experiment showing that the virus not only infects uh, respiratory epithelium, but also gut epithelium. Currently, we're, we're, we're trying to publish a paper where we've now asked in this system what host genes are key. There's about 20, 30 host genes have been published. You knock them all out. The only two that we find relevant in this system are ACE2, the known receptor, and TEMPRS2, which is the, um, uh, the uh, protease that activates the spike protein. This is important because from genome-wide studies in Vero cells, and these are African green monkey cells that almost every virology lab has been using for, for their experiments, but also for corona, Chloroquine actually scored as a fantastic drug, uh, and we can reproduce that. These are Vero cells. At one micromolar is the IC50. At 10 micromolar chloroquine, there is not a single viral particle being produced. If we add chloroquine to our organoids, nothing happens. And uh, I, I will won't take you through all the genetics, but we, we could show, and other labs have now also seen this, that these fibroblast-like Vero cell lines and similar cell lines, they will, they will need ACE2 to bind, but then they enter the cell by endocytosis. This needs cathepsin L, for instance, and this is chloroquine sensitive right here. But what epithelial cells do, real epithelial cells as they exist in organoids, they will bind to ACE2. They will not undergo endocytosis, but TEMPRS2 will activate. So it's a, it's a protease that activates the, uh, the spike. If you knock it out, we cannot infect the cells. If you knock ACE2 out, we cannot infect organoids. But once you activate the spike protein with the TEMPRS2 uh, protease, the, the virus now fuses with the membrane of the cell and it simply injects its RNA. So it doesn't require endocytosis and therefore it's not sensitive to hydroxychloroquine. So had these labs that originally published how good chloroquine was, had they actually used organoids rather than Vero cells, chloroquine would have never been given to tens of thousands of patients, which is probably it has been a very bad idea. And with that, uh, I think I named almost everybody that was involved in, in these studies. And uh, so I'll thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have time for, for a Q&A session.
and I'm not really sure because I keep on seeing my own presentation if I uh, if the if the PowerPoint can be switched off. Yeah, it's it, it's it's okay. We can uh, we can start here. Thank okay. thank you very much, Hans. Uh, wonderful wonderful lecture. There are many questions. I'm trying to organize here this this these questions. Uh, start here uh, this is a classical question for organoids but you know for an expert uh, probably get a better answer so as you said one one problem or limitation organoids is that you have usually one cell type there how is it is possible to make organoids with more components at the same time several yeah. components there yeah yeah so well we don't have one cell type because we actually get all the epithelial cells which is usually pretty complex uh, we're actually quite happy with that because uh, all the internal organs, the specific function of internal organs, are are almost always performed by the by the epithelial cells. So in the lung, it's the airway and alveolar cells. In the liver, hepatocytes and cholangiocytes. In the gut, it's the intestinal cells that the epithelial cells that take up liquids and produce hormones and things like that. However, they are not complete. Also, in tumors, we only have the cancer cells. We don't have the the additional cell types. Uh, so under these conditions, they don't grow out. Uh, we have done a lot by adding microbiome. I just showed this. That would be in the gut field. One thing that people say, well, you have to have the microbiome because otherwise it's not a real gut. Uh, we've done a little bit with other cell types, but other labs have started publishing on adding immune cells, which works, which works surprisingly well. Also adding mesenchymal cells. Um, that will actually maybe create muscle. Uh, there's actually a version of the gut done by Jim Wells where he has recreated the enteric nervous system. So this is the nervous system in your gut that it has as many neurons, I am told, as, as your brain has. Um, and it sits outside the epithelium in, in between the muscle layers, controls peristalsis and other things. So yes, you can build more complex uh, uh, organoids. We have really shied away from adding feeder cells or stromal cells. I mean, everybody says there's no stroma, there's a, it's not useful. But I think the strength of the system, as we've established, is the fact that we have replaced feeder cells that really are very undefined and very difficult to control from batch to batch. We have, we have replaced them by the essential growth factors that they make. So rather than adding feeder cells and grow cells on top, we, we, we have taken the products of the feeder cells and and let them let them grow and let them support the organoids yeah. i hope that's an answer no yes, yes, yes. Uh, very illustrative so uh this, this great model this great well, the results about the e coli in colon uh, I, I remember also that there was the bacteria in lung and a different bacteria a fusiobacterium or something so people are, are i guess are doing very similar stuff in with lung organoids or something like that i guess yeah, yeah. So Fusobacterium, uh, we're actually in a CRUK uh, Grand Challenge consortium with the people who described uh, Fusobacterium. So, so Matthew Morrison in particular at uh, Dana Farber. So, uh, so he showed that um, colon the people with colon cancer often have uh, have more Fusobacterium, a particular. Um, I don't, don't even know what's a gram positive, gram negative. They sit on top of the tumors, but can also they can actually sit inside cells. He even showed that metastasis in patients have fusobacterium you know, genomes, maybe entire live bacteria. So they seem to travel with the cancer cells through the body of a patient. And uh, so far, uh, it is not clear whether this is just uh, an association uh, whether uh, or whether fusobacterium is involved in inducing cancers or maybe maybe is used to to fight the cancers so that's part of what we're what we're uh, subjecting what we're studying there are several other bacteria i won't name them here but they're also associated with colon cancer or with polyposis and uh, so we're also studying those to see if they do the same thing as as what what uh, what this E. coli strain does but I should say that unlike viruses, so far Helicobacter is really the only bacterium that's known to cause, to be causative to cancer. And there's many other bacteria implied in, in cancers, but there's no causation. Now, I think our PKS E. coli might become the second one, but it still needs, needs more proof for that. But yeah, this is a very interesting field and there's thousands of papers, not all are very strong, I must say, but they associate various types of bacteria in the microbiome with, with colon cancers. No. Well, here are more uh, medical question. Uh, can you create the organoid just from colonoscopy material? Yeah, yeah. We, we need just a tiny biopsy, and uh, so 
So that, that we do we routinely do that. You, it needs to be deep enough to have crypts. So if it's extremely superficial, it doesn't grow. But a normal biopsy, you know, with one micrometer, little little piece, a needle biopsy for liver also works for metastases. And so we just have a paper accepted where for cervical cancer and the the, the pre-malignant stages, a a PAP brush is good enough. So that's typically done now to see uh, you know, routinely if, if a cervix is, is, is under threat for cervical carcinoma caused by papillomavirus. Um, that actually from a brush, uh, from a pet brush, we can grow, you know, 90% of the cases, we can grow uh, cervical organoids. And then they typically harbor the initial mutations that eventually, or the virus that eventually might lead to uh, uh, to cervical cancer. Yeah, you need very few cells. You just need to be alive. Uh, so you, and, and so you need to be fast. So you have to almost be next to the patient or be sure that the sample ends up in the buffer that you want to culture them in, in a matter of, of, uh, of, of a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes. At, uh, and then if you keep that, but keep the medium at zero degrees on ice, you can send it around the world. So we actually receive samples, patient samples, where the, where the sample was directly done, put in the medium on ice, was shipped to us, lost, and then three days later was found again by FedEx, and we could still grow organoids from those. So it's 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 exceedingly simple for now for most internal organs to grow organoids directly from a small biopsy. Yeah. That look, looks like a powerful tool. Yes, uh, even even lost in FedEx. Yes. Uh, <laughs> a, a very simple question. People asking um, this colibactin can be detected in the circulation in the blood. Of, of these yeah, people? Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, a very good question. But colibactin, uh, so, so these bacteria have been known for quite a while, about 20, 30 years at least. And uh, so it was always assumed, so the substance that they presumably were making was called colibactin, but it turns out to be extremely labile. So the chemists have worked forever to try to solve the structure, and there are no assays uh, beyond mass spec to detect it. And so again, so this, this science paper that I showed the, 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 the structure that we think is correct, is still a collection of closely related chemicals that they synthesized and then showed that it looked very similar to colibactin. So, so the colibactin substance itself, you cannot buy, and nobody can synthesize it because the moment you have it, it, it degrades. So we think that these bacteria really have to sit on top of the epithelial cells to almost inject it into the, into the host cell to cause these DNA damages. And I guess microbiologists believe, so why do they have this? at all, because why would they want to cause cancer? They believe it's essentially it's, uh, it's in the war between bacteria, so in their competitive activities, that these E. coli will kill other bacteria with this. And they actually, one of the 10 genes is a gene that inactivates colibactin. So if colibactin ends up in the, in the, in the E. coli that produces it, this enzyme will then destroy it. So they are protected themselves, and they can probably kill other cells, including normal E. coli, that, that don't have the PKS island. Yes, uh, I don't want to take out your time, so just a couple of questions uh, to finish in the hour. Uh, one relates to the um, technical about the creation of organoids. Uh, what about uh, generating organoids composed of cell types derived from different germ layers? For example, gut organoids with an enteric nervous system. Yeah. So that's a very good question. So, so our, I, I should have said this maybe, but there, there are two types of organoid technologies and they're very different. And so one is ours. So we start from adult stem cells, adult tissues. We give them the growth factors that that tissue normally uses for repair. And then we make organoids. Uh, those are always epithelial so far. There's the other uh, uh, starting point, which is not an adult stem cell, but an iPS cells or an embryonic stem cell. Um, and so these, so there, the approach is very different. You don't, you don't exploit the repair mechanism of tissue, you exploit development. So you essentially have to take these embryonic stem cells through the journey that you would normally make in an embryo to turn them into brain or into liver or into kidney or something like that. So this is essentially a, a recipe where you do one week of this, another growth factor, you block it, you shake, you, so, so it's, like, it's almost like magic. You know, for, for many brains, it takes six months to a year to get something that looks our real brain. Those organoids tend to be more complete. So they can have more. Hmm. Germ layers by themselves. And what Jim Wells has shown is if you make a gut organoid in that fashion, you can end up with a gut organoid that has 
no, our part, the epithelium, but also will have muscle that surrounds it. And when you then create neural crest from RPS cells independently and you mix it in, the neural crest will then make the, the, uh, the enteric nervous system. And, uh, and they, he makes quite convincing structures uh, in that way. So, um, but again, that so enteric nervous system, we cannot grow nerval tissues, we cannot grow muscle. Uh, so there, for that part, you really have to have to start from IPS cells at the moment. Um, another relates uh, to the um, you generate these mutations in uh, in your organoids to to advance the disease. But uh, in these four mutations, three are in tumor suppressors and one is an oncogene. If you change the balance, this it creates a different type of of readout of these models. You have BRAF, KRAS, more oncogenes than tumor suppressors. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the KRAS mutation we put in is the, is the strongest KRAS mutation. And actually, these cells don't require any EGF. If you take other KRAS mutations or BRAF mutations, they still they need a little bit of EGF. It's quite interesting. So the stronger the, stronger the mutation, the less dependent it is on EGF signaling. Uh, but they always will end up as, as colon cancers that are histologically the same. But I'm trying to think, but also so in liver, depending on the mutation types that you introduce, you will get different cancer types and also in lung organoids. So you can play around. You can basically look at, at the TCGA data and see what is a typical uh, combination of gene mutations in a particular cancer. If you then create an organ, you'll get that cancer. If you then shift the, the targets of your, of your CRISPR, you can give it a different, uh, you, know, you can create a different type of cancer in the same tissue, so that works. What I should also say is that originally we did this just by by the classical CRISPR-Cas9, so you cause a double strand break and then uh, frame shifts in the repair. But we more recently, and you might look up the paper, we've used base editors that were developed in, in Boston. And there you can actually, uh, so you don't cut, a, you cause a break, but you just, you change a single base chemically into another base. And about half of all mutations, you can, one mutation you can make with these base editors, two base editors. And now we can actually mix um, like five, six uh, guide RNAs, and with a single Cas9, we can we can knock out a number of um, of uh, uh, tumor suppressors, but also activate some some oncogenes at the same time by 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 inducing a point mutation, um, and that's extremely powerful because in one shot you get a whole library of individual organoids that will have one, two, three, four, five, or six of the uh, of the mutations. In each in, in in each individual organoid, so you get a library where you can just pick heterozygous, homozygous, uh, and, and that's what we've been doing a lot now to see if we can in one shot we can create all of the interesting mutations that we'd like to create. And and last question, so uh, related to the generation of colorectal organoids, uh, there are difference in the, how they're able to be generated between. Um, Sporadic and familial organoids in APC carriers, in uh, Lynch or Lynch syndrome, in their difference, and in between primaries and meds. The meds are easy to grow, or it doesn't matter. Yeah. No, so there's little, I think that's what people find generally that meds and primaries are not so different. And there's no, nobody has ever found, I think, unique metastasis genes. People have hoped to find these. So, so meds, you can clearly see that the med derives from an original tumor. Often they, they come in our hands, but also in other hands, they come from an, from an earlier version of the primary tumor. So if on the moment you take the, the primary tumor out, the metastasis has already been developing from, from maybe from a year earlier. Um, so there we don't see many differences. Uh, but yeah, but to say uh, the, the, the different kinds of colon cancer, you recapitulate if you take, you take them directly out of patients. So, so and when you transplant them to mice, you get exactly what you saw on the primary uh, patient. Our pathologists can actually look at organoids and come up with diagnoses. So that's not what they are trained at because they, they are trained to look at the entire tissue, but here they only look at, look at cancer cells. But in many cases, they can match the organoid with the original h &E of the tumor. Um, and by CRISPR, you can actually create you know, Lynch syndrome, uh, MSI, uh, the, the missense repair deficiency tumors. You can create APC mutants, beta catena mutants, and they typically recapitulate if you do this in human cells. They recapitulate what you would find in an individual patient. Yeah, so that I think in that sense that it's really the human approach. I had I've, we used to work a lot with mice, but using with uh, working with human primary cells really has a lot of value compared to using with using mouse cells.
Okay, uh, we, we will finish here. Uh, thank you again for a great talk and please congratulate the speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks see very much time. for your attention. Okay, Pleasure. see you next time. See you.